Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're looking at a Bowers and Wilkins Zeppelin speaker. This unit which came into the workshop was produced around 2008 and then in terms of specifications when you remove the speaker covers and these slide off but I'll go into a little bit more detail in a moment regarding those. You have a single speaker in the middle which will deliver 50 watts and in, this is a base speaker and then you have 2 times 25 watts for the mid-range and then right, and again I'll show you this at the end, you'll see that there are tweeters in there as well. And then for connectivity, remember that 2008, this is where you saw the Apple iPod series. So it supports the Apple iPod version 2, 3, 4 and the 5th generation. And at that time you had the iPhone 4G as well. Um, as you can see here, if you plug in any of those Apple devices, then the speaker has compatibility with regard to the software or firmware that it runs. If you wish, you can also connect an auxiliary input as well. So this is normally via the 3.5 millimeter jack socket on the rear. And the unit will automatically detect if it's an analog signal or it's a digital signal. And then if you wish, you can use the S-Video composite output. And that's kind of like a, a nice feature, I suppose, back then. Though, if you had, like, say, your 4G phone, or maybe you had the fifth generation iPod, and of course you could also connect a Nano to this if you wanted to. <clears throat> if you had images on there or you had video, then you could stream that directly then via the S Video Composite input. And then, in terms of weight and dimensions, it is a heavy unit, and it's a substantial unit when you've got it on the bench and you're working with it. And because it's kind of like rugby ball shaped, uh, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to sort of you know, get your hands around this thing when, you, when you're sort of repairing it. But again, more information in a little while. And then dimensions wise, for height it comes in at 173 millimeters, And then width, end to end is 640. And then you go up to 280, sorry, 208 millimeters for the depth of the unit. And it comes with a small little handy remote control as well. So what was the issue when it came into the workshop? Well, th what the customer was advising is that the unit did not power up. And of course, the first thing to check is the fuse in the power lead. And this is a figure of eight type power lead with a three amp fuse. And there's no issue there, but for electrical safety purposes, the lead was very old and it did show some signs of wear. So just because of electrical safety, that lead was replaced, but it was not the reason why the unit was not powering up. Now, the first thing I want to sort of draw your attention to is how you actually get access to the electronic circuit boards inside the unit. And the first thing you have to do, and this is, you know, I probably use the term easier said than done. You have to remove the left and right covers for the speakers. And what you have on either side is a small little uh, locking mechanism and you sort of press it in but you have to be very very careful on this unit they were missing but they have a high probability to just snap off but it doesn't sort of you know it doesn't lock it into position as such i think i think the idea is is maybe when these things are new that you can just press the the latch mechanism and just take the palm of your hand and slide off the dust covers in theory but I can reassure you that on this unit here, to remove those dust covers took a substantial amount of time and work to try and get them moving. And the only sort of comparison I can make it to is like a bicycle tyre, where you have a ridge on the edge of the rubber tyre and it sort of fits then into a, a lip on the main uh, wheel. But of course, that's fine if everything is the same in terms of the same width. Here, what you're trying to do is effectively slide these dust covers on and off and trying to get the alignment so it feeds into there, into these grooves, is very, very hard. It's not easy at all because what tends to happen is when you put the covers back on, there's an initial amount of weight that you, you're trying to you know, connect them in and then it just flares them out slightly. So you can be faced with where one side clips in you know, correctly, but then the other side doesn't. So, yeah not the most easiest of things so if you're unfamiliar with this you may have to use say for example a nylon six tapping block just to get those covers just moving uh, if they've been in place since manufacture so 
putting that to a side, how do you take this unit apart? Well, what I show here in the video, once the dust covers are removed, what you're able to do is to remove a series of fixing screws. And you, I think these are um, positive drive type screws and a positive drive one screwdriver. So here I'm showing that there are a total of eight main screws that you can remove. And then when you turn the unit over, just located on the left and the right hand side, you have two other self-tapping screws, but these are more, instead of a, a size, probably more like a size zero or a size one. I'd say these larger ones on the front are more like a size one to two. Once you've removed those, remember also as well, you have the docking station for the iPod or for the iPhone. Um, when you look underneath the unit, you have these uh, security Torx type screws um, and also as well, the rubber base plate isn't mounted via the Torx screws, it's self-adhesive, so you have to peel it off. So when you come back to complete the repair, what you'll find is you're better off removing that double-sided self-adhesive tape. And then, as I did in this case, you refit new self-adhesive tape, and then you know that makes sure that that rubber pad is connected. Once you remove the rubber pad, there is a total of four of these security Torx type screws and once you undo them just be very very careful because what you'll find is the flat ribbon cable which connects to the iPod docking station you have to remove that very carefully and then the next thing that you have to do is you have to separate the two units to gain access to the internal electronics and it's a little bit like a clamshell so you know again degree of caution here as you pull it apart You'll then see um, sound insulation material, which looks like sort of, um, I'd say you're almost sort of a little bit like cotton wool, you know. Uh, you can just move that um, slightly out of the way then, and then you've then got full access to the, uh, to the circuit boards. And then what I'm showing here in the video are the two sides of the unit. So on the left hand side, what you can see is the main, or should we say, audio processing circuit, all the smart stuff that goes on with regard to the different devices that you then can connect. And then on the right hand side, and this is the area of interest for the repair, what I'm now showing is the power supply. And remember this is an earlier version, you know, these Zeppelin units are still sold as smart speakers, but of course they have modern day connectivity back here this wasn't a wireless adapter type device. Um, it was a physical wired connection or via the dock station. And then what I'm focusing on is the small power supply. Now, we established already that there was no issue with the mains coming into the unit. Um, it connects to the board just via a two pin connector. And then just towards the lower part of the exit of the power supply or the secondary of the power supply, you can see that there's a multi pin lead. So the board itself is very, very easy to remove. And what you'll find is the board comes out and it's also mounted onto an aluminium heatsink because you have one of the power components on there. Uh, and also there's power components on the underneath of the board as well. All you need to do is just unplug the two connectors. And then there also is a, a common ground connector just on the left hand side towards the varistor. And then once you remove the board, you can then take it out, move the other items then to one side, and then you're clear then to do the repair on the on the circuit board. So the first thing that I'll need to check, and again I show you this in the video, there is a input protection fuse. So it's a 20 millimeter, five millimeter OD protection fuse, but this is the type where during manufacture they put end caps on there so they can solder it directly into the circuit board. And also as well, it has a ceramic cartridge, so you can't see through the fuse like a glass type fuse to verify that it's, it's failed or not failed. So that's the first part to check. So checking that with a multimeter, it could quickly be determined that the fuse was open circuit. So that kind of indicates to you that potentially there could have been excess current drawn, or maybe there was a power surge that just took the fuse out. So what I do here is the rating of the fuse and its reference number is F201 on the circuit board is a time delay 1.6 amp device. So what I've done here is I've just cut off some leads which have come from some power components, brand new ones, and that gives me the length. And then I've soldered onto the top and bottom of the caps of the new fuse 
so I can then insert it into the circuit board and just be aware that these, some of these circuit board traces are through hole type some are not some are so when you're removing the original component just be careful to remove the solder completely you know don't just pull it through otherwise you could damage the via but if that did happen you still have access to solder onto the top and the bottom of the of the connection or of the circuit track to fix the via if it was damaged so once the fuse was replaced of course rather than just power up the device or the, or the power supply the next thing that I needed to do was just to make a number of resistance checks and when I'm doing the test in, of the power supply and I'll put the link in the description for the video I power it up via the dim bulb tester and I've mentioned this on other repair tutorials before you know a dim bulb really does give you the opportunity that if you're fault finding maybe a power supply or an amp if you've initially maybe changed some components and there's still an underlying issue rather than you powering it up and the fuse pops and takes out your newly installed components the light or the the bulb current limiter will catch that and this was the case here so when i was doing the uh, fault finding what i'm doing is i'm now checking to understand potentially what component has failed and caused the fuse to fail and what i found was and again i show this now in the video there are four rectifier diodes. There's a 1N4007 and there's four of them there forming a bridge rectifier. And then what I found was that D201 was short circuit. So I replaced D201, exact replacement, and then I then powered the board up via the dim bulb tester. And the dim bulb lit quite bright. So again, that told me that there was something else going on. Now, I'd already checked the three remaining diodes to verify that they were okay. And overall, the reading seemed, seemed reasonable. But then I went back to go check, and what I felt was necessary here was to lift the diodes or one end of the diodes out of circuit to just verify that I wasn't being misled by a reading where it was connected maybe in parallel with you know one of the smoothing capacitors or some other issue there. And then what I found was that actually D202 uh, had not failed short circuit or even open. What had happened was it had gone low in resistance. So it was reading probably about, in terms of, because of, of, of course this is then done on diode tests, it was probably instead of reading about 0.6 forward voltage, it was way down probably to about 2.2. So more so like a germanium type diode, but then when you flip the leads around, where you should have no connectivity so i.e the um, negative lead now is on the anode of the diode and vice versa what you found was you had some bleed through. and then once i verified that the power supply was working it was a case of course of reinstalling the circuit board back onto the heatsink and then putting it back into the speaker and then connecting the necessary leads but what I would advise you to do, and this is very important, and again I've mentioned this on other tutorials, because this is a switch mode power supply, one of the components on there is, for the capacitors is rated at over 400 volts DC. So just be very, very careful. Because this unit had an open circuit fuse, then it had no ability to charge up that capacitor. But remember, if you were fault finding and maybe you were testing the unit and actually the power supply wasn't the issue, maybe there was an issue maybe with one of the other circuit boards, if you remove that board maybe to make testing, just put your meter on voltage and measure DC voltage, measure across that capacitor just to ensure that it is not charged. Here it was not, I think it was less than you know a couple of millivolts, so it was easy for me to you know, handle the board with no fear of getting an electrocution or an electric shock and you, what the last thing that you want is is receiving you know a dc voltage shock in excess of 200 volts right you don't want that so just a word of caution there just to make sure that you don't inadvertently electrocute yourself so once the power supply was back in rather than do you know to replace you know all the plastic cover and everything else it was then time just to make um, a test on the unit and um, straight away as soon as you know because you can operate this from the front where you have the ability to turn the unit on and off and then also the plus and minus then for your volume control so a quick test just to verify that it was working and indeed it was and i provide or i connected an input directly to the aux input 
and I could hear, you know, the music was very clear and loud and, and everything was good. And then the, of course, the assembly of the unit or putting it back together is straightforward. So just reverse process of what you've done. And as I said to you as well, just, uh, yeah, just allocate yourself some time when you try and get these disc covers on there because they will take a phenomenal amount of time on these older units. So that sort of brings us to a close now. Um, and again, as I always say on these repair tutorials, if you have any questions or you need any further information, by all means, come back to me and I'll be quite happy then to provide any advice or guidance for you. So until the next time, I wish you all the very best. Cheers and bye bye.